Hey everyone, welcome to our second session on total hip replacement uh, surgery. Today I'll be talking with you about how we set our patients up for success before they even get to the operating room. I'm Dr. Timothy Alton, a board certified orthopedic surgeon specializing in hip and knee replacement surgery here at ProLiance Orthopedic Associates. This is what we're all shooting for when it comes to hip replacement surgery. A happy patient, two thumbs up, I love my new hip, improved quality of life, less pain, and better function. And when it comes to hip replacement operation, I think that we've come a long ways and our patients have, in general, really, really good outcomes. But there are a few things that can happen um, in terms of complications. And it's really important for me as your surgeon to know what those complications are and what the risk factors are for those complications so that I can help you before you even get to the operating room to decrease the risk of one of those bad things happening. It's the whole idea of know your enemy and that can help us to prevent some of these unwanted consequences. And really, we do you no know, service if we act like my daughter Paisley here and just put our head in a bucket and pretend that none of these things happen. That doesn't help you. Um, and when it comes to hip replacement surgery, I think the three main things that, that I worry about are uh, infection, uh, either of the skin or deep down inside, having the ball pop out of the socket or having the parts loosen up. These are all things that are really uh, inconveniences uh, at least uh, for our patients and sometimes require repeat surgeries. And so uh, if we as a surgical and care team can understand what these risks are and what the risk factors are that control tribute to them, then we can modify those before we even get to the operating room and help you have a better outcome. It's the whole idea of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, something that Benjamin Franklin talked about centuries ago, and it's still true today. When it comes to hip replacement surgery, I've listed here what I think are some of the main factors that contribute to people having complications. And I'll go through each one of these in a bit more detail. Uh, but the first one is body mass index, which is a height versus weight calculation that gives us an idea of where you fall in the spectrum of uh, body mass compared to the general population. That actually stratifies risk. Diabetes is really important because if your blood sugars are out of control, it makes it hard for you to fight an infection. Malnutrition is really important. You have to be able to have enough nutrients to heal from your operation. Tobacco is a hot button topic that in the past few years, we've really come to recognize how risky uh, that is in terms of wound healing issues. Bacterial colonization. Uh, we've actually learned that people have bacteria that live on their body that can contribute to infections. And so we screen for that and we get rid of those bacteria if they're identified. The surgical site that we'll be operating through, we found that there are different ways that we can prepare that area that decrease risk of problems. And then obviously controlling Every aspect of the operating room is very important. Uh, in terms of thinning your blood after surgery, uh, we've learned that the more aggressive you thin someone's blood, uh, it can actually lead to more problems. Um, so we, we've really learned a lot about that uh, recently. I want to speak briefly to the COVID-19 situation and then also touch on this concept of prehab or prehabilitation, meaning setting you up for success uh, beforehand, even seeing a physical therapist to get you in shape before your surgery. So the first issue, body mass index and obesity. Body mass index is a calculation of your height versus your weight. And so what you do is you look at this very colorful chart here and you look at, okay, my height is and my weight is and you connect those two and you find a number. And then based on that number, you're classified as either underweight, healthy, overweight, obese, or extremely obese. And what we have found uh, in the literature is that if your body mass index is greater than 40, you have an increased risk of having a perioperative complication. And these authors here, each one of these is a different study with uh, thousands of patients looking at hips and knees and sometimes both. And what it shows inside that red box is that the risk of having a problem increases as your body mass gets over that threshold. This is a paper out of the Mayo Clinic. Uh, where I did some training, I actually got to work with these doctors who study these things. And if you look at this uh, graph, this graph has body mass index across the bottom and then risk is uh, going on the upper axis. And what I want to point out here is that as your body mass index increases, once you get above that 35 to 40 range, the risk of having a complication goes up. 
And so when we meet patients who have arthritis and need surgery, but their body mass index is above that threshold of, of 40, even into the 45 or 50 range, we counsel them that the risk of having a perioperative complication uh, gets higher and higher. Uh, and so we help people to lose weight to decrease that risk. Uh, especially at-risk patients are people who have elevated body mass index and then these other comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. And these patients can have risks up to 15, almost 15% 15 higher than the general population. Now diabetes, how well your blood sugar is controlled is essentially important. This is again, uh, similar to the previous um, body mass index slide, this shows the risk of people getting an infection or having a perioperative complication if their A1C is greater than eight. And so those of you who have diabetes know that A1C is something that allows us to track your blood sugar control over a prolonged period of time. And so what we really care about is how well your blood sugar is controlled for those uh, few months before surgery. And eight is the hard cutoff. If your body mass, if your diabetes uh, is not controlled well and your A1C is above eight, then we will wait on the operation until that gets to a lower level. We've also found that how well we control your blood sugars around the time of surgery is critically important. And so that time right after surgery, we, we very closely monitor blood sugars and wanna keep those levels down because it allows your white blood cells to fight off any bacteria that may be present uh, in your body that could potentially cause a problem. So that's really important too. And then the idea of malnutrition. And so the thought is, is that you're having a hip replacement operation and you have an incision on your skin and you have to heal from that. And it takes uh, all these different nutrients that your body has to heal from this operation. And so some patients who are obese with elevated body mass index, they're actually malnourished. And some people who are really, really thin are malnourished. So it's interesting, you can be either on one end of the spectrum or the other, um, or even have a normal body mass index and, and not be um, well enough to heal from your operation. So these are some of the laboratory tests or you know, we can draw blood and look for these levels to see. Uh, and that helps us understand whether or not we think you'll be able to heal uh, from your surgery. Now the idea of tobacco use. And so what we have learned uh, recently is that tobacco use and really nicotine consumption increases your risk of having a complication. And so that picture that I put on there, uh, that's a pretty gross picture, but it, that person, the only risk factor they had going into their knee replacement surgery, that's actually a knee replacement incision uh, that one of my uh, colleagues provided me, uh, that knee did not heal well. And the only risk factor that person had was they were a smoker, they smoked a pack of cigarettes per day. So because of this knowledge that we have now about increased risk and, and worse outcomes with smoking, uh, we have adopted a policy here at ProLiance Orthopedic Associates, uh, following in line with some of the major institutions in the country, such as the Mayo Clinic, and we help you to quit using tobacco and nicotine products before your surgery. So our policy is that a minimum of four weeks before your surgery, you're gonna be not using any nicotine uh, or tobacco products. We actually have our patients get a blood test at their preoperative visit just to show that all of that is out of their system and they are ready to go for surgery. And we can actually tell uh, you know, the difference between people who don't smoke, uh, people who uh, maybe have a cigarette or two from time to time, and even uh, we can tell patients who are exposed to secondhand smoke with this uh, blood tests. So it's not a punitive thing. It's just trying to optimize patients' outcomes. That's why we care so much about this. And now I touched briefly on the idea of colonization. And so what this means is that uh, there are bacteria that live all over our body. And everyone, even healthy people, have bacteria all over them. And specifically, we've learned that some of the staph bugs, that's the name of the bacteria that can cause an infection, live in different parts of your body. And there are some people who have resistant or MRSA, cyclin resistant staph aureus that live on their body. And if we identify these people before surgery, we can actually treat them to get rid of the bacteria that lives on them to decrease their risk of getting an infection by those same bugs after their operation. So we know that some people are at risk of being colonized with these resistant bugs, and so we check them. 
before surgery. And it's a, it's a simple swab that can get done. And if it comes back that you have colonization, it doesn't mean that you're sick right now, but it means that you have an increased risk of having an infection after your surgery. So we work with our infectious disease doctors and we get rid of those bacteria before we do the operation. And so this just outlines what that policy or what that protocol looks like, but it can delay your operation a little bit if you happen to be colonized with this, but the risk of having a surgical site infection being almost you know, 10 times higher, uh, it's just not worth it. Um, so we wait a little bit, get you optimized and then do the operation. And then speaking to the point of surgical site preparation, uh, for a hip replacement surgery, I do an anterior approach, which means I go in from the front of the hip joint. And Journal of Arthroplasty study showed um, that if you use this product called chlorhexidine on the skin before you have a joint replacement, uh, that you have a better outcome and you have lower risk. And chlorhexidine is a really safe chemical that specifically uh, kills bacteria on the skin. And so we actually have a whole protocol where you get these chlorhexidine wipes and you also get a chlorhexidine soap and you shower with the soap uh, before a few days before surgery and get wiped down the day of surgery to decrease the risk of having a problem. So during the operation, there are things that we do to decrease your risk. One of the most important ones is your surgical site preparation. So these are some pictures I took from the operating room uh, just last week. And so this is a patient's hip and it's their right hip and they're laying on their back and I'm taking a picture down at the right hip, you can see my initials TA there circled. We just want to make sure that we're operating on the correct hip at all times. And so what we do is once they're all positioned and, and getting ready to do the operation, we take some alcohol and we wipe the skin down to help kill those bacteria that could be left on the skin. And then this is a series of uh, pictures showing how we prepare the skin. So on the left side of the screen, that is a chlorhexidine um, stick. So the orange is more of that chlorhexidine that we were talking about that kills bacteria. And so we paint the whole skin and make it nice and orange like that. And then the middle screen, that whole area has been painted. And then we put on the drapes on the right screen there, that blue uh, are the drapes and those are sterile. And it just has a little window for where we're operating through. And then you can see that uh, I have a second stick of chlorhexidine and we prepare the skin a second time before doing the operation. And then once that second preparation is done, I lay this material over the top and that's called Ioban. It's an iodine impregnated, very sticky, almost plastic like layer that we press on top of the skin. I've drawn, drawn some lines across there just so that it can help me uh, get the skin edges lined up properly when we close the wound. So there's a lot that goes into preparing the surgical site before we even get started with the operation. And this has been shown to pay off. Journal of Arthroplasty showed we can decrease the risk of having a surgical site infection from 6.5%, so six to seven people out of 100, down to 1.8% just by doing this repeat preparation of the skin. We control how many people go in and out of the operating room during the time of surgery. We put these little uh, stop total joint in progress uh, signs outside the door so that people aren't coming in and out, and that decreases is your risk of getting an infection. We do these hoods. You may have seen uh, some of these before, either uh, on TV or in the movies. Uh, we don't wear those uh, because, and what happens is people kind of touch that area and you know, you're adjusting the hood or you bump your head into the light or something. And this study actually found that 43% of those hoods are actually contaminated. So we've stopped wearing those. And they blow exhaust out the back. And you figure this person uh, leans their back uh, up against the uh, either the patient or the table where all the instruments are and just blows that exhaust all over their sterile instruments. During the operation, I use a product that's called Irisep, but it's more of that chlorhexidine solution. This is a liquid form. And I actually soak the surgical uh, field with that during the operation. So in case there is a contaminant that happened to fall into the wound, uh, even though we do everything we can to decrease that risk, this product should uh, get rid of that bug. And so the reason that I use this product uh, is based a lot uh, on clinical research. So Dr. Spangel is a doctor at the Mayo Clinic that looked at the different things that we use during surgery to see if they actually kill bacteria or not. And they found that this product uh, that I'm talking about that has chlorhexidine in it kills one of the most common bacteria that causes an infection with even uh, just a small concentration of the solution, uh, even with a very short soak, as short as one minute. 
uh, and not only just that one Staphylococcus species, but all these different bacteria, MRSA, MSSA, Staph, Strep, Pseudomonas, Staph Epi, all these different bugs that we as surgeons care about, it kills them at almost 100%, 99.9987% with just a single one minute soak. So that's why I really like this product and I think it helps me get better outcomes for my patients. We, we all know that after hip and knee replacement surgery, you're at risk of getting a blood clot. Uh, in your legs, and so we thin your blood slightly afterwards. And we used to, we as a orthopedic community, used to be really aggressive at how we would thin your blood, but we found that that can actually thin it too much. And that surgical site we just operated through can get blood that forms uh, in there. That's called a hematoma, and that's essentially a culture media. It's what bacteria use to to live and grow. And so we actually have switched away from those strong blood thinners and like to use aspirin whenever we can. And that's actually got pretty good evidence that it decreases the risk of having an infection. Uh, so now to COVID-19, something that we all are living with these days and dealing with. And we at uh, ProLiance Orthopedic Associates here in Seattle, Washington, had a period where uh, we stopped doing hip and knee replacement surgeries uh, in compliance with uh, Governor Inslee's decree. And so we had a period where we weren't doing this anymore because you know, we wanted to have the ventilators available should patients need them and have enough personal protective equipment. But uh, that sort of wave has, has passed a bit. And I think it is safe to do these operations now. And we've started doing them and we've been doing them for a while. And you know, some of the things that we practice are you know, social distancing, both preoperatively and postoperatively. So uh, we have our patients, everyone's getting screened coming into the hospital. They're getting their temperature taken. Everyone's wearing masks. You're, you know, we limit the number of guests that can come accompany our patients. And we've taken over a particular floor of the hospital. It's just orthopedic patients with just orthopedic nurses. And it's very limited who can come on and off of that ward to make sure that no one uh, with COVID gets on to that ward. Um, and so I think that the hospital uh, has done a really nice job of making it safe to provide this service for our community. We even test our patients a few days beforehand to make sure that they don't have COVID-19 or they're one of these patients that you know, maybe has it and they don't know. Uh, so we catch those, those uh, situations before the operation. And if that happens to be the case, then we'll just delay the surgery. It's just like anything else, optimizing you for the operation. And, and you should just know that um, here at Valley Medical Center and at ProLiance Orthopedic Associates, the amount of cleaning of all the surfaces that happens is incredible. People work really hard to make this safe. And I think we are in a safe place right now. Uh, so just to speak to uh, what a lot of us are, are sort of worried about in the community. Uh, and I'm glad that we can get back to offering hip and knee replacement surgery for our patients in a safe, responsible way. And then finally, uh, this concept of prehabilitation. And so we think of the uh, surgery as you know, sort of, it's almost like game day. That's the big day where you know, everyone's thinking about that and excited about that. But really, you know, a hip replacement operation takes about an hour to do. And there's all this other stuff that leads into getting you a good outcome. And it's all those things that we talked about. And another one of those is making sure that you're as strong as you can be going in. And it can be tough to build your muscles and get your cardiovascular uh, endurance up because your hip hurts so bad. Uh, but you're going to a physical therapy session, even before surgery, helps you know what are some of the exercises that I'll be doing afterwards? What are some of the exercises I can be doing now to get my muscles strong, to get me as flexible as I can be before surgery? Uh, and, and sort of helps you plan your recovery too. Um, you know, in my house, do I know where the bathroom is? Do I have stairs? Uh, do I need an elevated toilet seat or a flat toilet seat or arm rails here or there? Or how do I get in on the shower? Like all of these things to think about um, before surgery, and they can help with that. And, and we, you know, the more we do this, the more we learn how important it is to have good social support. You know, someone that can be there for you, whether it be a friend, a family, a neighbor, uh, something like that, just to to look in on you and make sure you're okay. And, and we like to have all of those things sorted out before we even get to the operating room, so that uh, we know that your surgical date is this particular date. This is how you're going to get there. This is who's going to pick you up. Uh, you know, either uh, after the operation and and just have everything figured out beforehand. So. You know, when it comes to getting you that uh, excellent outcome, right, the double thumbs up patient after hip replacement surgery, uh, I want you guys to know that there are a lot of things uh, that we think about before surgery, and, and, and uh, most of them don't have to do with the technical part of doing the operation. It's modifying these risk factors, getting weight down, optimizing blood sugar control, helping people to quit smoking. You know, it's all of these different things that we can control that that prevention um, beforehand 
knowing the enemy, knowing what the risks are to help get our patients the very best outcome. So when you come and you talk about having your hip replaced and we're talking about all these other things, I hope you have a little bit of a foundation as to why we care so much about that. So we're going to switch over here and do um, a bit of live questions. So thank you all for your attention.